And now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening, which is Deb Ellis, our very own Deb Ellis. Uh, I have known Deb now for, oh, I don't know, six, seven, eight years. I don't remember how long I've known Deb offhand. Uh, but she was actually the founder and is our chapter leader of our Essex County chapter. Um, she is very passionate about native plants, very passionate about the use of native plants in the landscape and keeping it simple. She, she really got into gardening and native plants while commuting to New York City and raising two children. So keeping it simple and creating an elegant garden with native plants is really uh, something that Deb has been working out for years. And I'm really looking forward to her presentation this evening, Sustaining Wildlife in Fall and Winter Gardens. Deb, please take it away. You are muted. I need to unmute myself. Okay. There we that's go. The worst, that's the worst thing I do tonight. I'll be good. <laughs> so thank you, Randy. I feel truly grateful for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, and thank you. So I thank the Native Plant Society for the opportunity. And I thank all of you for joining. I appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight. We are on the cusp of fall. It doesn't actually start until this weekend, but the weather is getting cooler and our wildlife companions are busy preparing for the challenging season ahead. So monarchs are fueling up for migration, pollinators and squirrels are provisioning for the winter. Before we talk about how to help these creatures in the fall and winter, I want to do something a little different. I want to find out about you. We have a couple hundred people um, watching this, and I know you are a diverse background, and I want to know something about you by um, taking a little poll. The poll is one question, and the question is, how do you grow goldenrod? And the possible answers are yes, no, or I'm not sure. So um, if you could answer that poll, that would be great. And um, I see that people are, are right away answering it. So that's great. Um, as people are, as people keep answering, I wanna say um, that wildlife especially needs our help at the fringes of the growing season in the early spring. And I was lucky to do a spring talk a year and a half ago and in the fall. So um, there's mums all over the place. There's chrysanthemums being sold as the fall flower in so many different places. But I hope tonight to introduce you to some native plants, native plants that were here before the colonists came. Mums are not native. That will help our um, pollinators. So the um, poll I think is pretty much done. That shows that 75% of you grow golden rods. 23% do not, and 1% are not sure. So I predicted about 75%, um, and I am thrilled to hear that, um, That uh, I don't know if you could see the results, but I'm, the results are 75 to grow that. So that's fantastic. So I know that I have a very educated audience. And I just have to figure out how to advance the next slide. Okay, so, Here's what I want to do tonight. Um, I want to talk about how we can sustain the creatures around us in these challenging months. Um, I'm going to spend do four. I'm going to have four uh, parts of my talk, and about half of it will be spent on fall, on um, providing food with flowers in the fall, and then half the time will be on three topics in winter, providing shelter with ground covers, providing shelter and food by leaving the leaves and stems and providing food with berry producing bushes. I hope that everyone learns at least one new thing and that the 25% of you who do not grow goldenrod and who have a garden might um, decide to grow some. I also want to mention that um, before we start that this is a webinar, not a meeting. You are all muted and you are all not on video, which means you can eat dinner. This, um, if you want to, ask questions, please ask them in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, do not raise your hand, that won't work. The Q&A is the place to 
ask them and we will do a short q a afterwards um, the chat will have links in it, so you can look in the chat for that. Our great tech people will be putting links in it as we go along. And we will have this webinar um, recorded and on the Native Plant website in about a week. The slides will not be shared, so if there's a slide you want to take a picture of, please feel free to do that. So you might be asking, you're going to talk about fall plants and buying them, but there's so many plant sales. Most of them are in the spring and sometimes the summer. There's very few in the fall. Well, that is true. Um, but unfortunately, that shouldn't be the case. Uh, fall is actually a great time to plant. It is the number one time to plant woody things like shrubs and trees. And it's an excellent time to plant everything. Why? Because it's cooler. So the plants go through less transplant shock, uh, shock. It's easier for them. So I want to tell you how to be a savvy shopper and starting by um, how to decode plant names. So today I'm all, tonight I'm going to always talk about plant names by their common names because they're easier to pronounce um, and they're easier to remember. But plants sometimes have more than one common name. So we urge you to use a scientific name when you're going shopping. And the scientific name consists of two words here, the genus here and then the species. And if it's just those two things, we call it a straight species plant. There's also things that are cultivars, literally cultivated varieties. This here is an example of a cultivar. It's the purple dome cultivar of New England aster. At the Native Plant Society, we recommend that people use straight species whenever possible because they have the most ecological value. We discourage cultivars that change the flower or leaf color or have double blooms, like this rather crazy echinacea here, where there's a bloom on top of a bloom. Why do we do that? Because we're afraid the insects um, will not be able to find the plants. They don't look like what they're used to. Cultivars are less problematic, though, if they don't change colors and simply are shorter varieties, which is what Purple Dome, my example, is. So how did I choose the plants to focus on tonight? There's so many plants, and I love so many of them. Well, I looked for plants that will most help wildlife. Um, for flowers, I focused on ones that bloom in September, October, and even November. And I'm going to focus first on asters and goldenrod because they are keystone plants. That's why I did the poll on asters. And I'm thrilled that 75% of you already grow the asters. What is a keystone species? Well, I think it's pretty well known to you, this educated audience that if that certain butterflies and moths will only lay their eggs on, on certain plants. The classic example is monarchs can only lay their eggs on milkweed. Without milkweed, we won't have any monarchs. The fact is that many um, butterflies, that there's a few plants that are the biggest host plants that host the most caterpillars. And so um, the plants that support these are called keystone plants. This is a term that Doug Tallamy uses, and he has studied what are the top keystone trees and the top keystone flowers that support the most butterfly and moth um, species. And the top keystone flowers of any of them are asters and goldenrod. And the third is the native sunflower, helianthus, that I will also talk about tonight. So here's asters and goldenrod, yellow goldenrod and purple asters in my front garden. They are superfoods. Not only are they host plants, but they produce valuable pollen and nectar. Robin Wall Kimmerer writes about them in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which I highly recommend. It's sold over a million copies. She looks at the world through the eyes of a botanist and as a member of the Potawatomi Nation. She explains that growing together, yellow goldenrod and purple asters receive more pollinator visits than if they were growing alone. They are opposites on the color wheel, and so they make a strong contrast that is literally a beacon for bees. So planting them are a great way to help wildlife, and I believe there's a goldenrod and aster for every situation, for every garden. 
So for some of you who do not grow goldenrod, one of the reasons might be that you're afraid of it causing allergies. I've heard about that a lot as a reason. But actually, goldenrod pollen is not windblown. It's sticky and therefore moved around by, sorry, <laughs> it's moved around by hardworking insects like what we're seeing here. So what's making you sneeze? It's probably ragweed, which blooms at the same time. So now that I've hopefully put to rest the hay fever objection, let's begin with my favorite goldenrod. And for the 75% of you who already grow them, maybe you'll learn about a new one and another place to put one. So wreath goldenrod, I say, takes the gold due to its elegance and its wide adaptability. It's notable that it can grow in both sun and shade, and I have pictures of both of them here. It has two common names, as do many native plants. The wreath goldenrod name is because it can be twined into wreaths. Um, the blue stem, I'm not sure, because to me, the stems look actually really green, so I'm not sure. On each slide um, about a plant, I am going to list the growing conditions like I do here. I'm not going to read them all. I will summarize them. But if you, I want to list them because I'm a practical person. I'm a master gardener and I know people like to have that practical information. Feel free to take a picture as I mentioned before. So um, the, I want to explain a little bit more about wreath goldenrod here in the right. It's growing um, on what is called a, depending on where you live, um, it's called a health strip or a berm or the strip between the sidewalk and the road, which is what it is. And this is um, in the, I'm gonna call it the hell strip because I think that mm -hmm. is a good, um, it's a good uh, characterization of what it's, um, of what's like the growing conditions are there. It's very salty, very bad soil. So if something can grow in the hell strip, um, it can grow anywhere. So here's, um, wreath goldenrod going, growing in a hell strip um, at my friend and colleagues, Jess Miller, Jessica Miller's house. And to the left is growing um, here in my sh shady garden. Another great uh, goldenrod that's, but can only grow in the sun is showy goldenrod. Here it's pictured on the left growing at the Montclair Public Library. Um, and it's, it's, true, it's true to its name. It's a very beautiful goldenrod. Um, and at the right, we have a smaller goldenrod, only one to three feet tall. You can see that here um, on the right here. Um, so although it's growing in a garden in Jessica Miller's house, it's suitable to grow in a pot um, for those of you who may not have um, an actual garden. Both of these can grow in a range of soils. And I want to give you a tip about goldenrods that especially is useful for the taller ones like showy goldenrod. Um, and that is that you can cut them in half to make them be less floppy. It's really hard to cut our plants in half, but it really works. Um, this technique has a name called the Chelsea Chop, which is named because it's often done in, in some places, not here, but some places it's done in late May, which is when the Chelsea Flower Show is in England. I do it in mid-June and I just do it once. There are those who think you should do it at Memorial Day and 4th of July, but I'd rather just do it once. It really works. Hard to cut your plants in half, but it helps them to not be floppy. It also can delay the bloom time a little bit, which can be nice. So you could actually do them at a little different heights in order to get a little different bloom time. Our last golden rods are these two. Perhaps you want to combat invasives. Perhaps you have a big space and you're looking for a more aggressive golden rod. So I wanna explain what I mean when I say aggressive. I never call a native plant invasive. An invasive plant is a plant that is from another country and that outcompetes our natives. An aggressive native is one that spreads quickly. Some people call them bullies. Um, I've already told you some goldenrods that are very well behaved, like wreath goldenrod and the um, zigzag are especially well behaved. 
But there are situations where this is um, helpful to have uh, one that spreads quickly. Um, you may be working to try to get rid of invasives and you know that you have to plant a native to combat it. And this would be a good choice. This is a picture of it at the Great Swamp um, a couple of weeks ago. For wet, um, for wet places, I recommend Seaside Goldenrod, which tolerates amazingly either fresh or brackish tidal water. Also because goldenrods um, do are, are very important, they actually are still growing in nature. I saw them in, in the fields. I saw them last week down um, in uh, the Pine Barrens and I saw them yesterday along the interstates in Northern New Jersey. So be on the lookout for them. They're a beautiful fall flower to look at. So now we're gonna move on to asters. And you can see that they are a superfood for migrating monarchs. My friend and colleague, Dina Corbin, caught this wonderful picture of a monarch in her Newark garden. Both asters and goldenrods, in fact, are monarch magnets. Our pollinators need a diet rich in protein and carbs as they prepare to migrate or hibernate. Asters also support specialist bees um, that uh, need that want to um, live on asters. So there's another, love the bees on the asters. And another cool thing about asters, I find as Randy said, I'm passionate about native plants and I think they're very magical, is that they have really different colored centers. You can see here that some are very, um, are kind of medium red, some are dark red and some are yellow. And the pollinator, which I thought was a bee, until Randy um, told me um, nicely that it was a searfoot fly. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, the pollinators go for the yellow ones. It's their, it's nature's way of telling them that the dark red ones, the pollen is gone. So I've named that aster stoplight. It's a fun thing to look for as you see asters and you will see some growing still in the wild. So my number one recommendation for most conditions would be the New England Aster. Here I have the New England Aster Purple Dome that is the cultivar, um, which I bought more than 22 years ago before I even knew there was such a thing as a cultivar. It's blooming, um, it's just beginning to bloom now and will bloom into October. It does want um, to grow in sun, it will not grow in shade. And you can also cut these in half. You can also do the Chelsea chop on them. But the thing about these is they have low gear resistance, which makes me realize I did not mention that goldenrods in general are gear resistant. That was an important omission, so I apologize. Um, because I know a lot of us in Jer New Jersey deal with uh, deer all the time. So goldenrods in general are gear resistant, um, but these are not. So the deer walk down my urban Montclair street and they do the Chelsea chop for me. They um, are constantly munching on my New England asters and finally they give up and the asters bloom. So I don't have to do the work. Um, so now we move on to um, an aster that's really great in shade and notice again the yellow and reddish um, centers of this one. This is a uh, aster that is great for the garden. I have it growing in um, dry shade in, the, in my backyard. And it's also a good aster to know about as you're walking. It's one of the few natives that's still visible in the woods and roadsides. I, um, I imagine that it's deer resistant because it's in so many places that, are, um, that have deer. So I think it has more deer resistance than the New England aster. And you notice from the um, the size here, that's a little shorter um, too. I really admire those natives that persist um, in, in the wild or in our, even in our, like it's in my, our high school yards that they persist um, in spite of habitat loss and pesticides, et cetera. So now we come to two, our two last um, asters. One is here on the left for a, in a pot and it is the smooth blue aster. It is shorter, as you can see, it's only one to three feet. Um, so it's a perfect size for a pot and also nice that it can grow in sun or shade. 
For late season nectar, I want to recommend the aromatic aster which is not native to New Jersey, but is native to many states around us. It is so notable, noticeable that it goes all the way to November and it goes, um, it will grow in a wide range of soils. Here it is actually in my health strip again. In, in Northern New Jersey, many of us have small yards and so we use every inch we can. This has a different, um, growing habit than New England Aster. I do not have to do the Chelsea chop on it. And the deer don't either. It's deer, re it seems to be deer resistant. It has a nice um, little form, like almost like a, a bush. Um, so it's a great one to try if you um, wanna have some sequence of bloom, some late blooming Aster. So this is the end of our goldenrod and Aster section. Um, and we'll end, we're ending it with a view of my friend Leah's front garden. Another friend of mine recently went to Portland and said that there, there's a movement to have full frontal gardens. So I hope that we can have a movement like that in New Jersey and have more and more gardens that are in the front um, of our properties. I also want to highlight here that um, Leah has a pesticide-free zone sign. And I think that is a nice thing to remember that it's really important to first do no harm. And if we want to help our wildlife in fall and winter and throughout the year, the first thing to do is to um, don't use insecticides. So now we're going to talk about a few more um, fall flowers that also have high wildlife value. The first is a native sunflower. As I mentioned, they are the third most important keystone plant. Uh, again, a, a plant that supports our butterfly and moss by being a plant that they can lay their eggs on. Sunflowers, as you know from the non-native sunflowers, are a great bird seed too. And the native ones are really favored by the birds too. This is a fantastic photo that was taken by Becky LeBoy, who's one of the leaders of our, um, of our Jersey Shore chapter. And I think it's amazing to get a picture of a, a actual bird because it's hard to do that, they fly away. But you can see here, she even captured it with a sunflower seed in its mouth. Incredible, right? So the sunflowers um, as a group are a great source of bird food they have a really long bloom time as a, um, a, a group, um, and they uh, are generally not deer resistant, and they're also very tall. This one is three to six feet tall. Um, and by the way, I wanna mention the goldfish, goldfinch, for those of you who might not know, is our state bird. So two other uh, sunflowers to consider, the thin leaf sunflower, these are all helianthus species. Sometimes as I did on the swamp, sometimes on my slides, I'll shorten the genus name here um, if they're all the same. So the thin leaf sunflower is growing here in a community garden in Newark that is tended um, by my colleague and friend, Dina Corbin. And you can see it here. Um, in the back, it's the, it's the taller one going back here. There's also asters and goldenrod in the front. And then um, over here is uh, the swamp sunflower, which is notable, noticeable for being eight to 10 feet tall. And this is, uh, is reported to be deer, resistance, deer resistant by my friends, John and Susan Landau, who run a beautiful, amazing community garden in Morristown called Foots Pond. So, and Susan was able to capture, I want to highlight this, uh, both a skipper, I think, and it looks like a bee, but two insects on one flower, as if you need more proof how valuable these are for our pollinators. So now I'm going to talk about gentians. Gentians are adapted for bumblebee pollination. The bumblebees are actually the only insects strong enough to pry open the flowers. We hear a lot about problems with honeybees, but I wanna mention that they are not native to New Jersey. They're not native to the United States. So I wanted to highlight um, a plant that's important to a native bee. 
the bumblebee, which is actually endangered. We are living through a biodiversity crisis of epic proportions, and many bee, butterfly, and other species are threatened. It's also um, interesting that this plant can grow um, in a full sun to partial shade. It's a little shorter than the other plants we've discussed, a lot shorter than the sunflowers that only grows to one to two feet. Um, and I wanna just kind of explain what's going on here. You can see that the, the ends of the flowers are very tight, but the bee actually goes down in there gets the pollen, turns around, and comes out the other end. Is that amazing or what? And I actually have a little video to show you. There it goes, prying it open. That was tightly closed. You can't even see the white of the flowers before it gets in there. And then it actually stays in there a while. I didn't keep taking the video. I hope you love the magic of that. I didn't mean to do it again, but it's worth watching again. Okay, so we also want to help provision hummingbirds for their migration. Um, and for that, you could consider the cardinal flower, which I call a hummingbird magnet. Um, it blooms in the fall, August through October. It's pretty flexible on its sun requirements. And although it prefers moisture, I have conducted a mini experiment in my yard by growing it in lots of different places, including fairly dry places, because I just love it so much. So like many natives, it's fairly flexible. It has some deer resistance. The deer though did eat it, but it came back to bloom. So maybe it's kind of like the Chelsea chop in my deer, they can coexist. It's a nice thing to consider for school gardens. Here on the right, it's pictured at the um, Wachung School Garden here in Montclair, and because it blooms when the kids are there. Our Essex chapter um, has written a guide to school gardens, and we hope to have it posted on our website by November. And in it, we emphasize using plants that bloom in the fall and the spring when the students are in school so that they can enjoy them. So snake root is a plant that you probably don't have to plant, but I want to tell you about it so that you know about it and that you know that it's more than a weed. It frankly does act like a weed and all the, all the growing conditions over here basically come down to it will grow anywhere and you don't have to plant it. It's deer resistant. It does well in dry shade. It does, it grows in sun to shade. So this is between my garage and my neighbor's property. And I did not plant any of these, and there's a lot of them. However, this is a great thing because it's a great um, fuel for the pollinators. And if I didn't have this growing there, I would have Japanese knotweed from my neighbor's property growing there. So I'd much rather have the snake root. And it's something you're also going to see as you're walking around. There's an interesting little story about snake root. It contains a poison that was evolved to prevent herbivores from consuming it. But in times of drought, sometimes cows would wander off into the woods and eat it. And in the 19th century, people would get sick from this. People didn't really understand the cause and effect of it. And the cow's milk was poisoned and it was called milk sickness. Unfortunately, Abraham Lincoln's mother died of this in 1819. So we can also remember that this is the plant that killed Abraham Lincoln's mother, but it's still good for pollinators. So we'll end with a flower with beautiful blue color and a bloom time that goes into November. It's um, the blue mist flower. And you can see here that it's attracted a little um, peck skipper right here. It um, has a lot of uh, a wide range of growing conditions, but it is a little shorter again, like the gentian, one to two feet. And this is growing um, in my friend and uh, neighbor's garden, John Saskatchewitch here and he plants along with other things that are, um, they all keep each other in check a little bit because it can be a little aggressive. And here it's in a big meadow and the pollinator garden in Brooklyndale Park started by my friend and colleague, Jane Greeley. So it's a really nice thing to put into um, a meadow. 
I have to mention that this peck skipper, when I was taking the photo, also did go to snake root and aster. So it wasn't limited to this. So we're going to end now um, the uh, with the, the fall flower section. Um, here's a recap of what we've um, talked about. And I um, sometimes just want to mention that sometimes I feel really worried about the loss of insect and birds. I've mentioned it a couple of times already. But I always am encouraged when I think about all the colleagues and friends who are working hard in the community gardens, like the ones I've already mentioned in the Caldwell Pollinator Garden started by Anne and Warren Marcioni. I get more hopeful when I think about that. Um, here are the flowers that we've talked about. And I just want to highlight here at the bottom there, you can get more info at a great database at Jersey Friendly Yards. And of course, our native plant website has a lot of great info too. So my friend and neighbor and colleague, John Saskatchewicz, writes beautifully, and he wrote about wreath goldenrod. Bees and butterflies descend on it in October as if it were last call at the only open saloon on the block. I believe that that's true for all these flowers. They all provide a last call for the creatures to survive the winter. So now we're going to talk about winter and creating a winter wildlife habitat. So I want to begin by looking at this snowy landscape at the Brookdale Pollinator Garden. You can see how things are, stems are left up and read something that um, its, it's uh, creator, Jean Greeley, wrote. She's also an amazing writer. She wrote this, any evidence of living things you may come across is just a fraction of the vast soil ecosystem of plant roots, fungi, worms, snails, microorganisms, and more, all alive, growing, producing food, and reproducing underground at a slow snail winter's pace. If you see small holes, these are entrances to ground nesting insect cavities and serve as cozy earthen homes for eggs and larvae of bees and butterflies that were recently buzzing around the garden. So how can we help these creatures that maybe we cannot see? Well, I'm using the slide about birds as an example, but it's really true for all the wildlife we're trying to sustain. They need um, water, cover shelter, also called homes, food, and nesting sites. Nesting sites are really just equivalent to homes in the winter because most of the nesting is done later or it's done in their winter homes. Water is easy. It can be provided with a bird bath like this one. Here's an electric one that keeps the water heated or defrosted in the winter. Um, so we're going to focus um, in our discussion about the the cover and shelter requirements and the food requirements. I'll talk about how we can provide what wildlife needs both by planting cover, um, cover plants and fruit bushes. And perhaps most importantly, I'm gonna talk about not doing some things we've traditionally done like an intensive fall cleanup. So the first thing I'll talk about is creating winter homes with plants. And you, um, because wildlife really needs shelter in the winter from both the cold and from predators, adding a native grass is a great to your is a great way to help. I'm um, although they are not evergreen, their structure and their fronds do persist throughout the winter. They also provide um, not only shelter but seeds for birds too, and they have beautiful fall color. I want to highlight two kinds here. There's many. But here's switchgrass, once again, growing in that hell strip um, at Jessica Miller's house. And this can, um, one nice thing about switchgrass, it can grow in all types of moisture. And then here's little blue stem growing again at the Watchung School Garden. It's doing a double duty of having cover for animals, but also cover for the air conditioning. And then here's the same um, species growing in the pollinator garden in winter, um, not in the snow, but in, the, in a winter scene. So you can see how the structure persists. Another idea to consider are evergreen plants, both as wildlife shelter and for us as gardeners, it's nice to look out and see evergreen, right? 
So here um, I'm featuring um, part of a garden that is maintained by my colleague and friend, Alice von Strahlen, who lives in a condo development. And I really admire that she has worked to incorporate native plants into what you can see is also traditional things like a privet hedge here. But let's focus on what she's done with some native evergreens. There's the plantain leaf sedge here. Sedges are a great plant to consider in general. Um, and uh, I think my great tech people are gonna put um, the uh, a chart from Eisel Nursery that is a great summary of sedges in the chat for you. This one is a clump, it has a clumping habit. And although this picture was taken in September, it really does stay evergreen. So it's almost like a little small bush. It's also a host for skipper butterflies. Another idea is that some of our flowers that this one blooms in the spring, um, it's called golden ragwort, um, has these evergreen basil rosettes, they're called. And that's a great way to have, have cover too. So just leave them there, let them be, and that stays very evergreen all winter. So my last plant recommendation for winter shelter are evergreen ferns. Ferns are often the understory in our woods. And like Robin Wall Kimmerer, I like to learn from the woods. Um, here they are, I took a picture of them at Kittatinny State Park um, when I was on a field trip with our Sussex chapter. Ferns are an ancient family of plants. They were, they were eaten by dinosaurs. Um, so, and I think they just look cool. This, um, our two evergreen one here, evergreen here, um, Christmas fern and marginal wood fern. They have similar growing conditions. They both um, are happy to grow in the shade. They prefer shade. They have uh, wide range of soil moisture and they're deer resistant like all ferns. So if people are looking for deer resistance, please consider ferns. This here is a Christmas fern and it was used by the early settlers to decorate their homes. So the marginal wood fern and the Christmas fern have a little different habits as the winter goes on. The marginal wood fern on the left, you can see that the fronds um, stay more upright. And the Christmas fern um, tends to get more prone, although it has charm in its cascading form. Both of these firms also do a good job at holding the leaves in place, especially like maybe in the front of your yard where you wanna leave leaves, but not disturb your neighbors. So this brings us to our next topic and perhaps our most important topic, leaving the leaves. I'm gonna even don a colorful leaf scarf here to emphasize how beautiful the leaves are. So leaving the leaves are a great way to provide shelter and food without needing to plant anything. It's really easy. It's perhaps the best thing we can do to help our wildlife is to just rethink the idea of fall cleanup. Unfortunately, lately in the last um, few decades, we've been stripping the garden of the things wildlife needs to make it through the winter. So what should we do? Actually, as little as possible. One reason I like native gardening is it gives me permission to be a little lazy. So as much as possible, try to rake leaves into garden beds and under trees. The many small lives that live there that Jean Greeley described will thank you. Leaves help insects have cozy food on the floor, cozy homes and food on the floor for insects and birds and squirrels. So leaves are insect habitats. You might wonder where do butterflies go in winter? And I'm a little embarrassed to say that I really never thought much about this um, until a couple of years ago. We all emphasize the monarchs and migrating to Mexico because monarchs are endangered and their trip to Mexico is magical. But actually, monarchs are the only butterfly, at least to my knowledge, that migrate. Most of them stay here and they overwinter in our fallen leaves in various stages of development. As eggs, as cocoons, and even as adults. Adults, that sounds crazy, right? Well, the morning cloak is a good example. It overwinters as an, an adult in like crevices of, of old buildings or logs. It contains its blood as a sort of antifreeze that protects it from um, freezing. Swallowtails overwinter in their chrysalises, which is the butterfly word for cocoons. 
I actually was remember hiking once on March 17th in the woods. It was a sunny day, but that's really early. And there were all these swallowtails and it's because they were emerging. So please try to leave the leaves around um, in your garden beds, around trees, um, because we want to grow the trees because they often are host plants like the oaks. But if we are removing the leaves beyond, below them, the insects that have lived in them are then going to be um, killed. So it's really important to leave the leaves. Leaves are also a blanket for perennial, for perennial flowers, helping insulate them from the cycles of freeze and thaw. So just to illustrate, I want to highlight this cocoon for this moth, the Cecropia moth. Here it is. It looks a lot like a leaf, well camouflaged. Unfortunately, well camouflaged for us too. So um, it's it just shows how we may think that it's just leaves there, but there could be lots of little lives going on. As the forest teaches us, leaves are good for our gardens too. What happens to all those leaves in Kitsitini Forest and the other forests? They disappear, they, dis they decompose, and they make the really rich soil. No one ever takes them away. Even if there's a lot of trees, like there are all these trees, lots of leaves, but they all just decompose. Sometimes people worry as gardeners that nothing will be able to grow through the leaves. So I have a picture here on the right of a bloodroot popping up early in spring. It's the one of the first spring flowers um, through my leaves. And so once you leave the leaves, you can just let them be. You don't have to remove them. They're going to decompose as fertilizer and become mulch. But you may have some excess leaves. I'm going to give you some ideas of what to do with them. And I ask you not to use blowers on them. So you can pile as much as you can into your garden beds, your vegetable beds, and your uh, flower beds, and around trees. A thin layer can be left on the grass to decompose. You can save them for garden mulch. I sometimes save them in extra ones in brown bags or an old plastic trash can, and then use them um, on the mulch next as mulch next season. You can compost extras and you can rake them into bags if you still have extras. I urge you not to use leaf blowers. Both electric and gas leaf blowers blast away wildlife habitats. As the German Ministry of the Environment said, they are fatal to insects in the foliage. And then gas powered leaf blowers are extremely noisy and polluting. Margaret Renkel, a New York Times writer, said the gasoline-powered leaf blower exists in a category of environmental hell all its own. It's hard to put it more strongly than that. It is polluting. It uses a two-stroke engine that is much more polluting than the four-stroke engine used by most um, lawnmowers. It's noisy. I don't have to explain that. You have heard them. And it's bad for human health, especially for the workers who have to use them. So here in Montclair, we have a group of us have actually worked to ban leaf blowers. Um, they're gonna be banned now um, all year long. Um, but we started with a seasonal ban and I wanna mention that because that might be more palatable um, to other towns to start with. We prohibited them all year, except for two months in the fall and two months in the spring. But on my slide, why do I say one month in the spring? Because actually I think that's what it's, uh, that would be a better way to do it. So that you would only permit gas leaf blowers three, three months a year. That's a good start at least to working for a full ban. There's more info at a, web, a wonderful website called Quiet Montclair created by a friend and colleague, Peter Holm. So that is fantastic source of information. He also recommend, recommends Sustainable Princeton website. And if you want to learn more or work on this for your town, Lois Krauss, um, who heads up Advocates for Transforming Landscaping in New Jersey, kind of a mouthful, has said that I could give out her name and email here, which I'm sure they will put in the chat for you. Um, and feel free to contact, contact her if you would like to work on this issue in your town. Okay, so in a, now we're going to move on from leaving the leaves. So in addition to leaving the leaves, you can leave the stems and seed heads. 
So they are both habitat, they're both shelter and food, and we're going to first look at food. So leaving the flower and shrub heads um, are seeds for birds. They, I'm going to start with this right hand uh, photo here. This is a photo again of our gold, our state bird, the goldfinch in winter, so it's less bright. And it's also taken by Becky LeBoy. And the, she caught the goldfinch here eating the seeds. See that little seed in its mouth? Of the summer sweet bush, which is also called sweet pepper bush because its seeds are like little peppercorns. So, you know, I grow um, summer sweet. I bet many of you do. And we don't have to take those seeds off ever. Um, they just wither away and die eventually, right? Why would we spend our time cutting them off? And especially now we'll know not to do that because they're seeds for birds. Well, that's true for other flowers too. So here on the left, we have coneflower, which is another great one to leave up for the birds. Ideally, you would want to leave all the stems up for both food and habitat. But I've listed some of the flowers that are especially important for producing seeds in the winter. No surprise, asters, goldenrods, sunflowers, also blazing star, joe pie weed, and purple coneflower. So also leaving stalks and seed heads are good for insect homes. As I mentioned before, we have a lot of native bees and we actually have over 300 species of them in New Jersey. None of our native bees live in beehives. You may, we may think they, we may have thought that, but they don't. And 30% nest in pithy or wooding stems. So it's great to leave the stems for possible nests for them and other pollinators. People always wanna know, well, when should you cut them down in the spring? Well, I'm gonna say something a little crazy, but if possible, never. Again, I'm going to look to the fields and woods as my teacher. No one's cutting things down there and it's doing fine. And you don't walk through it the next year thinking, oh, there's all those stems. So a lot of them don't really have to be cut down very much. So let's really think about it before we cut them down. If you do cut them down, one source says, wait until the tomato planting time is, which is about Mother's Day. So wait as long as you can, at least until mid-May. Or wait longer because as our entomologist president, Randy Eccles says, many of the things that use them as stems, as homes are not merging until later in the spring or even June. A technique to cut them back is to cut in six inch chunks and then leave them around the stems so that if there are creatures living in them, they can still escape. And also leaving the stems around the plant lets them decompose. The plants actually don't need us to cut them down. They would prefer to decompose, if we could ask them, decompose and live in their own soil. So at least what we can do is if we do cut them down, keep the soil around them. You could also put it in a brush pile would be another option. So I hope I've convinced you to not be a neatnik and that leaving leaves and stems can help the creatures around us survive throughout the cold winter. I want to end with this picture for this section. I took it in a formal garden in Montclair called Van Vleck, and I was struck by how beautiful it was. And it makes me realize what another friend told me that Piet Oldhoff once said, that brown is a color too. So as you're leaving alone your winter, your garden for the winter, remember brown is a color too, and indeed, this can be very beautiful. So my last section is helping birds get through the winter with five berry bushes. Why can't you just use a bird feeder? Well, bird feeders are good um, assistants, but the native berries have a lot of nutrients in them that are really good for hibernation and for living through the winter. How did I pick the bushes? Well, some bushes are long gone, like serviceberry, blueberries, elderberries, viburnums. So I'm focusing on the berry bushes that are still here. Uh, so I'm gonna begin with um, black chokeberry. There's also a closely related red chokeberry you might wanna consider. Um, this is a plant that is super beautiful for its blossoms and then has these luscious 
um, berries here that actually are edible to humans, although they are named chokeberry, and I don't think they're very tasty in my opinion, supposedly high in antioxidants. Um, I want to mention the sun conditions for all the shrubs are the same. They're all understory shrubs in the woods. And so they are all um, going to be um, fine to grow in part shade, but prefer sun that will produce more berries. I find that catbirds especially like this. And um, yesterday I saw a chipmunk in my ch um, black chokeberry. So it was a reminder to me to tell you that mammals like these too. Dogwoods are also a nice um, uh, shrub to consider. It has fall fruit um, like this white, um, these nice white berries right here. And they come um, in a nice bush size. I'm featuring the red twig dogwood, which is beautiful with the red twigs you can see um, from the Morton Arboretum. Um, and notably, it can get grow in wet soil. I've included this bush, snowberry, because it has great berries and is not well known. The Lady Bird Johnson Center said it's an old fashioned dooryard plant. Um, indeed, they're growing in my husband's childhood home in Wisconsin. I've probably been growing there for decades, but it's not one you see around a lot. Um, it's a nice replacement for a privet hedge. I actually took out my privet hedge years ago and replaced it with berry producing bushes, much easier to take care of. And it has these beautiful white bushes. There's a companion plant called coralberry that has pink bushes. Um, these do persist into the winter. And that raises the question, why do some of these bushes berries persist when some like elderberries are eaten so quickly by the birds? Well, there's two schools of thought. One is that these are not quite ripe yet, even though they're there, that they'll become more palatable as the winter goes on. The other school of thought is perhaps the birds have to be really desperate in order to, to eat these. Who knows? I want to mention that these are hard to find, but they're available at Prairie Nursery in Wisconsin by mail order. My last two bushes are called dioecious. That means that they need you need both a male and a female bush, and that only the female bush produces berries. Inkberry holly is a nice example of this. It's our native holly, there's several, and it is evergreen. So it can be a replacement for boxwood, um, the, the English boxwood, which is not native. Um, it is fairly deer resistant and I um, it doesn't have much blooms, but the berries are really nice as you can see here in the picture. There's also other native hollies such as American holly, which is a tree and grows to be very large. And this is yet another holly, another native holly, winterberry holly. This is our last bush. And this is deciduous, unlike the inkberry. It's glorious in the fall with its prolific berries. And you need a male bush. But in my case, I don't have a male bush, but my friend and neighbor John across the street does. So that male bush seems to, to help mine. Um, and in general, for these dioecious bushes, you don't need a male for every female. One male can take care of several females. Um, this can also grow in wet conditions. And in fact, it's growing by my sump yard, my sump pump in my yard, a very wet condition. So I want to end with a story. A couple of years ago, I was worried because that winter berry bush that I had, you saw all the berries on it. It still had that many berries. Look at this in China, oopsie. It still had that many berries in uh, the winter in February. And then one day it snowed and the robins all came. This pic, the first picture on the left is in the snow too. But I had to, it's hard to get pictures of birds, they fly away. So I went upstairs and took this picture from my bedroom window. You can see all the birds um, on the winter berry bush and all the ones waiting to go there in the hydrangeas. So I didn't have to worry. This is just an example of how all the berries will eventually be eaten by the hungry birds and they'll be, be delighted with any of these bushes that you choose. So before we end, I want to give you some ideas of where to buy these, um, these things I've mentioned. Remember to be a savvy shopper and to take the scientific names with you. 
Also ask to make sure that the plants were not grown with systemic insecticides like neonics that would then um, kill the pollinators we're trying to sustain. Our local garden centers may carry some of these, such as the asters and goldenrod. I want to mention Well Sweep Herb Farm over here, um, which carries ferns. It's not a, it's not exclusively native, but it's good at having ferns. And then we have um, a, a, a few of uh, mail order natives here. Some of them specialize in plugs. Here's an example of a plug pot. It's very deep. And the plug pots are um, make really efficient ways to plant and in economical ways to plant because they have really well-developed roots. I would also like to mention Toad Shade Wildflower Farm here, which is run by our president. Um, and she often does events like chapter events and eco fairs that are listed on her website. Another normally mail order place, Wild Ridge Plants, is actually having an open house um, in 10 days. Also, we, our chapter is doing a shrub sale. I'm gonna, that's right up here. And it's gonna be at the, um, on September 30th. There's more details about it on the Native Plant Society website under events. We are pre, um, we are allowing seven shrubs to be pre-ordered. And I'm going to extend that period to this Friday. So if you're interested in pre-ordering shrubs for our shrub sale, please go to our website and look up the details that will be available from now until Friday night. Um, so to conclude, I hope that I've given you some practical ideas that you can use this fall and winter to help sustain our fellow creatures by leaving the leaves and stem, by planting a goldenrod and aster, something evergreen, and maybe a native bush with berries. And also, Remember not to be a neat neck in the spring. There's a final photo. Here's my gift to you. Um, it is a picture of some of most of the, the things we've discussed um, that was done in uh, mid-November to showcase how beautiful our native plants are as um, a bouquet. I want to thank all my colleagues and friends who inspire me in this native plant movement and give me hope. Um, and especially thanks to all of you who contributed photos. And finally, thanks to all of you for attending. I learned a lot in preparing for this talk, and I hope that you learned something too. And now I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Deb. That was truly fabulous. We've got some really great questions that came in and um, some really great pictures on there. So I think I'm going to try to go through the questions a little bit sort of in, in the same order as your presentation went, if that makes sense. Um, it does. So, so first of all, we were talking about asters and goldenrods. Um, we had a couple different questions that came in about, about how insects, how much of the plant do they really use? There was a really interesting question about goldenrods. So aggressive goldenrods. Does anything actually use the seeds or can you just cut off the seed heads before they go to seed and, and let them flower for the pollinators, but get rid of the seeds? So um, it, to research this talk, I actually looked at Xerxes Society and actually I did have that on my slide, but didn't say it. Xerxes Society is a great source of information about invertebrate conservation. And then I looked um, to see which things are the most important to keep up and they did list asters. So I would say, no, don't cut your asters or your goldenrod, sorry, asters and goldenrod were both listed. However, I have to be a realist. My goldenrod is growing along my sidewalk. So what you can do is cut down the ones that are interfering with pedestrian access, but leave some in the back. So that's a good compromise. Um, but since they are actually on the list of the ones that are most useful to keep, I think that um, you shouldn't cut them down. And then I assume that the person asking does believe that they are useful for pollinators. And all you have to do is look at a goldenrod. They are full of pollinators, even when I went for a walk at six o'clock tonight. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, there are, I, I believe there are actually quite a few birds that really enjoy using those goldenrod seeds through the winter. Um, which is probably one of the reasons Xerxes left it open as well. Um, so a question about deer repellents. 
I thought this mm -hmm. was a really good question. Does spraying the deer repellent interfere with how insects or other pollinators can use or find native plants? Well, that is um, a good question that may be beyond my expertise, but I would say looking at what is in the deer repellents I use, which are mostly foul smelling things like rotten eggs and mint and hot pepper, I suspect not. Um, but I guess if an insect is using it, but trying to find it by smell, I think they're usually finding it by color. So um, I don't know, Randy, you're the entomologist. Maybe I should pass this one to you. What do you think? The, the, the research hasn't really been done, um, but yeah. I can tell you that there are absolutely insects that find their plants by smell. All we have to do is look at monarchs. Monarchs, right. monarchs are not like eagles. You know, they're not spotting those goldenrods. They're actually finding them uh, by smell. So when we when we affect the smell or the chemistry of the plants, we're affecting the ability of of insects and pollinators to find those plants. I would say that I use deer repellent sparingly. I did give a couple examples of how you can live with a deer, like with the New England asters, and they just do the Chelsea chop. I don't try to stop them. Why? Why should I? Um, so, uh, and I think the other thing I actually found useful this summer is I kind of hid some of my um, flowers I know they like, like my sunflowers, um, underneath the things I know they don't like. So that was really effective. So some other techniques you can use. I do use spray once in a while, but very sparingly. I think that's probably a really great answer. And yeah, I've, I've also tried the, um, you know, I find mountain mints very useful for hiding things amongst. Um, right, you can call those soldiers, like you can protect um, pr plants with soldiers around them that, you know, that are gonna be very deer resistant. Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of questions about leaving the leaves. I think leaving the leaves is still very new to a lot of people, um, newer than even growing goldenrods. So there were a lot of questions about that. Um, one of the questions was um, yeah, a couple of people said that they like to collect their leaves and then shred their leaves very fine and then put them back out as mulch and and was that a problem or would that be as useful for the insects well that's a technique that we've talked about in the past but having thought about this more for this talk and just where i always feel one thing i love about gardening is i'm always learning more is i think it's not so good um i'd say that it's because if you're shredding them you're probably killing some of those little creatures so if you can not shred some of them, especially the ones you're going to put on your garden beds, they don't need to be shredded. Let's minimize the work. Let's be a little bit lazy. And the whole leaves can be put onto garden beds and they'll be fine, just like they're on the forest floor. If you are shredding them maybe in your lawn, then there might be some times when you would do that. That might be a good way because you don't want to have too many um, whole leaves on your lawn. So there might be a place for it. But I used to wish I had a shredding mower and now i'm glad i never got one so i think it's not the best well that took out another question because several people were worried about leaving too many leaves on the lawn so you've just answered that one um are there any leaves that should not be left in place the, the specifically they're asking about norway maple leaves i think you can leave all the leaves norway maples are not um native um and I actually have a Norway maple that lives next to me. Um, so I get some of its leaves and I just leave them. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't want to try to separate out my leaves. So that sounds, <laughs> sounds if we're trying to minimize work. So yeah, I don't think you have to worry about it. That, that, that there's a great cartoon to be seen there somehow. Someone out there sorting out. I think so too. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, well, there was, there was another um, really interesting set of questions about germinating seeds so if they've planted seeds in their garden and then they rake a bunch of leaves on top of them is how how do yes. germinating seeds deal with that that's a good question um i think that you know it depends on the seed and some seeds do want a little bit of light 
But again, I always look to the woods, you know, those plants are germinating in the woods with leaves over them too. The leaves are, the seeds are dropping and the leaves are dropping over them later. So I don't know that that's a problem, although I guess maybe you might not want to push extra leaves in those places. As a seed seller, Randy, do you have any further ideas on that? I think to a certain extent, it depends on the seeds. Mm -hmm. um, so seeds, seeds of woodland plants are used to coming up through leaves. That's right. that's that's very traditional for them. But some of the more sun loving seeds, many of them will come up through mm -hmm. through leaves. Um, you know, meadow plants. You know, you know, Mother Nature doesn't go in and clear off all the leaves so that the meadow plants. No. Can um, exactly. Uh, but you know six inches, eight inches of leaves are going to be a bit much. You know, one of the um, uh, management techniques that they've come up with for stilt grass is simply burying them under giant piles of leaves. So it's, um, I, I think there there are a few times where, much like your lawn, you might want to move some of the leaves aside. Just mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. I'm, I'm, I'm looking over some of the questions here. Um, a question about shrubs. Um, mm -hmm. You were talking about the fact that you had the female um, winterberry hop. Oh, and, yes. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you didn't need a male because your neighbor, John, across the street has a male and, and one male can service many females. And we're not even going to go into the details of that. But the question was, how far apart um, should, you, should you plant? Um, how far apart can you get away with? planting um, males from females when you're dealing with deciduous shrubs? Well, or with a dioecious shrubs. The, um, that's a good question that I am experimenting with. So I bought um, one male and three female ink berries a couple of years ago. And I have to say that the female I put next to the male has berries. The two that I put farther away do not yet but it's oh, they're only three years old. So I don't know if the male has to get bigger, um, but I'd say to be safer, put them close. I think the example of my neighbor, I wanted to include it because it's a fun story, but I don't think it should be the standard. I think you probably want that male a little closer. Um, actually, I sometimes move things around too much and I lost track of whether I had a male or female. Um, but so we're just supposing that that's what's happening. Um, but I think they being closer is probably better. So like, say you had a hedge of ink berries, have a male every three, um, every three, three bushes or so. That's probably a good answer. I think you, as you say, you can get away with it sometimes. It depends, I think, somewhat on the species and um, how, um, how busy your bees are, I suppose. Um, and there's, there's a couple other questions that came in, Trey. I thought well, there was one about holly leaves. And of course, holly leaves don't break down very easily. But there was another one about... Although the winterberry hollies do. Yes, but I, they were talking American hollies. Okay. Um, but a really good question came up about leaving, I believe it was beech nuts in your lawn. And it's, it's a question that I've actually um, seen raised before about um, gumball, sweet gum balls in the lawn and acorns in the lawn and beech nuts in the lawn. Um, and I know that this is, um, I mean, quite frankly, the, the gumballs vexed my father in the lawn because he had to, he felt he had to rake them and he didn't like stepping on them. What are your thoughts about leaving, you know, beyond leaving the leaves, leaving the nuts in place, leaving, well, leaving, leaving the nuts in place is oh. part of leaving the leaves to me because they're going to be food for the, the mammals, right? So I titled my talk Sustaining Wildlife. And of course, I we tend to focus a lot on pollinators and birds, but squirrels are active all winter and the chipmunks are provisioning now. So I think that all of those things can be food for mammals and would be part of leaving the leaves. Now, it might be different if you have um, sweet gum balls, like on your sidewalk, you're going to rake them up, right? right. Um, and so you want to be um, careful that they're not in a place people are going to walk. Actually, one of our people on our steering committee um, took a terrible tumble with an acorn a few years ago. So, you know, there's you have to be cautious, too. 
and you don't want to have them a place where people can walk. That's one way I distinguish, as I said in the beginning, I try to clear where the sidewalks are, um, we'll clear a little bit where I have to put snow, um, yeah. you know, so uh, if it ever snows again, <laughs> <laughs> which I hope it does. <laughs> well, 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 we'll leave that with one. We'll go with one last question, uh, which is actually leaning toward climate change, because we've had some very strange weather this year. They were asking about the fact that some things are, are blooming out of sync, that they've got viburnums that are going into bloom right now. And how might that affect uh, the berry set? I don't know. I I have never... I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know if any viburnums are going, going into bloom. I would think if they're going to bloom now, they may not have time to have berries again. Um, there are some plants like coral honeysuckle um, that do keep blooming a little bit into now. I actually thought of, of um, including it, but I had to make some hard choices. <laughs> um, so, but I don't think viburnums normally bloom now. So, and I don't know why they would be. So I, I think that would affect the berry set for this, for the rebloom, but it shouldn't have um, affected it for earlier in the summer. Yeah, certainly, certainly with global warming, we're going to be seeing some strange, strange things happening. And yes, it would, be nice. It would be nice if it snowed again. Wouldn't that be lovely this winter? Um, yes. Oh, I think I think we're about wrapped up here. We're up to about 8.15. I think we've gotten through most of the major questions that came in. Really great bunch of questions. I want to thank everybody for all their great questions. And I want to thank Deb for a, just a fabulous presentation this evening, um, reminding everyone to prepare your wildlife for winter, leave the leaves and leave the stems, and um, gave you all permission to be um, a bit of a lazy little more la not a lazy gardener but more of a lazy gardener Take right a more a lazier gardener helps the birds get the worms say there we go and thank i just want to thank you randy for hosting i want to thank all the people um at nato plant society who are behind the scenes making this webinar work and i want to thank all the audience for um for attending tonight thank you so much Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And be sure to go to mpsnj.org and check out the website. And if you're not a member, become a member. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Take Good care. Good night, all. Bye-bye.